All right, I would introduce myself, but I think I just did to everybody. Um, which is going to be very, very, like, just we're hanging out, right? Yeah, well, I was going to say, normally I'd say a little spiel, but I feel like yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a beatbox. It's me. Hey, this is beatbox. <laughs> everybody knows. Does everybody know Yay! Everybody? You're here, you're very close to breweries or a fridge, and it's a good place. <laughs> um, the Epon's good, Capital One's cool. Yeah. Um, feel free to tweet and use social media. Use our hashtag Richmond Jug. Um, the Richmond Jug user, user group's pretty awesome. I've been a part of it since I moved to Richmond five years ago, although I had two children, one that's one and one that's three, and so I'm sorry I don't come out much anymore, but if they're here, it's only a mile and a half from that. So. Um, yeah, so I'm Sam Edwards at my Capital One. Um, I'm a Google developer expert for Android. There's about a hundred of us in the world, so this is like a recognition from Google for creating like expert content for, um, for Android. I'm actually also a Google developer expert for Kotlin. There's only like 19 of us, so that's really cool to be a part of that. Um, and I've been doing Kotlin for about a little over two years now. Uh, yeah, so Kotlin, isn't this a Java users group? So this is, I want to get a poll real quick of people, like who has used Kotlin? All right, cool. So I'm gonna just like ask questions, ask as many questions as you want, and we'll dive in. And how many people write Java? Okay, that's good. Uh, and how many people use dependency injection or know what it is? Okay, okay cool. All right, we're good then. Um, <coughs> so yes, this is. Uh, I was making a joke with one of the other organizers. This should be the uh, JVM user group. So like any you know Java virtual machine language, but. Um, I, I do love Java. It has a place in my heart. My first job out of college, 2004, or right at the end of college, uh, was doing Java 1.4, wrote Eclipse plugins. It's great, but Android. So Android's the problem because you get locked into Java 7 bytecode. So the Android platform itself, like what's been released through uh, over time, Java 7 is the only common denominator that's there. I don't remember if the very like latest operating systems have support for like Java 8 or something higher, but you would essentially never be able to release, release an app that would go backwards. There's no way to do the backwards compatibility, so your bytecode has to compile to Java 7. Um, there are a few Java 8 language features available, um, most importantly like Lambdas, and so the way it does that is through the Android like, build toolchain, like as you compile, then it actually takes that and converts it into Java 7 bytecode. So you, you put your like compilation settings to be Java 8 syntax, but it compiles down to Java 7. Um, so yeah, Java 9, 10, 11, 12, sorry, not me, I'm really sorry. I think you guys have had a talk on like what's new in one of these at some point. Um, and I didn't listen to it because I had kids, and so I'm sorry. I don't know, so I'm the ignorant guy that doesn't know of all these cool things. And I know there's a lot of cool stuff happening in Java, but how many people are using Java 10, 11, uh, 9, or yeah, who's using 9? 10? 11? 12? See, nobody else uses that. You guys are cool. All right. Um, okay, so somebody was asking me, like, what is this? And I don't really know. But these two things are the release dates for the various Java, like, more modern things that were supported on Android. So Android started at, um, at 6, uh, but then it was able to support 7 after a while. And, yeah, then we get to Java 9. So basically anything's happened after 2014, you can't do it on Android. So, Unfortunately, like I'm saying, I don't know anything about anything more than Java 8, so I um, So there's a few language features it talks about from Java 8 that you can use in Android, and that's nice, but basically Lambda expressions is the thing that is beautiful that was, it was a big thing. Um, but now, why, are, why Kotlin, right? So we talked about Java, we love it, this is great, it's been the official language for Android up to this year. So two years ago at Google I.O., um, Google announced that uh, Kotlin was now going to be a first class, like, accepted language for Android. So they support Java and Kotlin, but they, like, still didn't have their preference. You know, Java was the way to go, but <coughs> Kotlin would be supported. But this year at Google I.O., they announced that Kotlin is the preferred language of Android. So if you're writing Android apps, if you go to the documentation for Android, everything is in Kotlin. You can hit the tab and look at the Java version as well. Um, the reason why this is like kind of the switch was available is because the interoperability between Java and Kotlin is just beautiful. Um, so why Kotlin? Um, does anybody know who JetBrains is? So yeah, they're the company they're based in Russia. Probably nothing to do with the government, but like they they make this amazing IDE called IntelliJ. Uh, about IntelliJ's IDE idea. Um, and so like if you've written Java, have you guys all used that before? 
pretty much. It, it's glorious, and that's what Android Studio is actually based on the community edition of IntelliJ idea, and then it builds on all the Android tooling on top of that. Um, so <coughs> Colin is written by JetBrains. The, the core team that developed it are from there. And it's under active development very heavily and has a growing community. If you look at one of those Stack Overflow what you, language people love charts, I don't have it here, but Colin's, you know, rising very quickly. Um, it has a ton of new language features. Uh, most recently, there's like Kotlin coroutines, which is like part of the reactive framework that you can use in Kotlin. Um, we're using that, and there's, it just kind of keeps evolving very quickly. The thing about it is, it's essentially just a compiler and a library that you write your Kotlin code in, and then it can compile down to, right now, Java 6, 7, or 8 bytecode. So the Kotlin compiler is that cool to take any Kotlin code and bring it down. That's what I said. Okay. Um, and like I said, effort, effortless interoperability with Java. So you can take any jar file. You have that open CSV library, because you don't want to write your own thing. You just go pop it in. You instantiate it. You use it. You're good. Any other library you want to use, that, that's that jar sitting out there, Megan, from 2004. It works. Um, so for me, Kotlin makes coding fun again, at least compared to Java 7 or 8. I was trying to be like, I don't know how many people use 9, 10, 11, 12, and so I didn't want to make anybody mad by being that ignorant guy that like, I don't know. So I'm sure there's really cool stuff. Is there any really cool things you like about 9 and 10? Yeah, uh, for the 11, they are getting this bar keyboard becoming very close to Kotlin. Oh, like bar and bow? Yes. Yeah, so that's the thing in Kotlin, if you don't know about it. So Yeah, type of thing. You don't have to be yeah, declarative on everything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay, so why am I here today talking about dependency injection with Kotlin? I'm talking about this because this is a talk I did for an Android conference uh, about our experience with my team building our own DIY dependency injection framework. And so this whole talk is really going to talk through why we built it, why you want to use dependency injection, different types of dependency injection, and then just with our specific use case, the decisions that we walked through to come up with this method. And then at the end, just kind of like this beautiful like realization that dependency injection is like really not that crazy. And with Kotlin syntax, it's like very concise and you don't need these crazy frameworks. At least it gives you some structure that way, but you don't have to have it. You mean like spring? Yeah, I'm going to mix that in a minute. So actually, who used Spring before? It's not me, actually. I've never used Spring. Um, so I did J2EE development, mostly for App Engine. And what's that? Sorry. It was beautiful in a day. No, I, I didn't know anything about service at that point. I, and so for me, as a like developer in like 2009 or 2008, I was able to write some Java code in the back end and then to deploy to App Engine. It, it was great. So at the time, though, I used Juice because that was like the thing that people were using. Um, and I never got in the whole Spring thing. I just That worked for me, that little recipe. And there's a lot more powerful things I'm sure you could do with Spring, and that's the enterprise way. But um, yeah, like I said, this is going to share the story of my team and how we implemented it, um, demystify, demystify the topic of it so you can kind of like understand what dependency injection is, show you how you can implement it yourself if you choose. I'm not telling you you need to. It's just it's an option, it's like I'm saying. And show you why Kotlin makes this feasible without tons of boilerplate. So our story on my team. So what is my team? So I've been at Capital One about five years, um, and the team I'm on now is a team um, that builds like common libraries for identity. So this could be login, it could be like second factor auth, it could be new apps, anything related to identity. So that, that's our team. Um, yeah, our team previously built Capital One Wallet. This was a secondary like companion app. Um, so this had the feature I worked on that I was most proud of was like our competitor Google Pay and Samsung Pay. We were the first like US bank to implement this, but we legitimately were our own thing. Like we weren't Google Pay, we had our own. It never took off because nobody used it, but it was really cool that we did it, but also it hurt my brain. So I recommend and don't recommend to learn about that. Um, but we got tasked to build this reusable SDK for authentication. And this is the first time we were really building, really building a complex, complex SDK that we're gonna deliver to like multiple clients. So I'm sure you guys have all used like SDKs from various vendors and things like that, and I'm sure you have some wonderful experiences, but mostly probably really bad experiences. Does anybody have any like yay or nay? Like any anybody had any bad experiences using somebody else's SDK that a client gave you? Yeah. It, it, anyway, so we, as developers, you want to give a good experience with your SDK. So um, a lot of things to learn. 
So the product requirements that we were given by our product team to say like, hey, this is what we want, is they wanted to cut down costs, improve security and things by like creating one like uh, configurable piece for authentication that we could use in all of our apps. Because we might have like five apps and then we might have different partnerships we're working with and we want to use that same code base everywhere and not have all this work to be good. Um, we wanted to assume that like clients would be, we, we didn't want to assume they'd be using a third party library. So a lot of the times you write your code and it like, like I was saying, it depends on Spring and, and Apache Commons and this and that and like you pull all these things together. If you're writing something on the server side, there's no, it's not as bad because you just can run it on the machine. But like when you're putting it on the device, every single byte you put on there is more baggage to bring along. So you want to try to avoid that because you want your client to say, oh, look at this little thing I put in and it works great. So we got to stay lean and lightweight to do that. But we also have to make our SDK configurable. So we want to build it in a way that somebody can use it to their liking, right? So we might have three or four different apps that both want to use it. I want the core functionality, but I want little things different. And I want to hit this server. I want to make it look a little bit like this and things there. So I tried to, we didn't have these like when we first started, it was probably in our brain, but I kind of, after we started building this project, I wrote these things down to say like, yeah, these are probably our core principles of the things that we wanted as a technical team. Um, we definitely want to react to programming. We've gone into RxJava, really liked it. Um, has anybody done React to it before? All right, one. Um, anybody interested in it? Or? Okay. And then I'm half like scared of it still. Like I finally, like I think I've gotten over the bar, but it's really cool and really powerful the same way all these programming things are where there's this huge hump to learn. Um, but it's something that's really powerful. So we wanted to use that. Uh, data immutability is something that's I found just as experience over the years is so important. Does everybody know what immutable data is? Basically that once you set the data, it cannot be, the value cannot be changed. Um, this is super important in writing code that's gonna be like single purpose, like the code, here are your inputs and then you compute an output. Right? So it's very predictable. Uh, modular code, so we wanted to write this in a way that we could make a build for client A, client B, client C, or whatever else, and give them just what they needed and I think right now we have 64 modules in our code base and we have like eight developers. So like we've separated things out a lot. Some of them are like test only modules, other ones are like just splitting apart like utils or, or things of that nature, or features even. And single responsibility code, kind of the way of what I said. Um, so it, modular code base requires you to have things be single re responsibility. It's like these are gonna be the things that compute date and time and these things are gonna do encryption. Right, so it's like, this code is only supposed to be for this, here are my inputs, here are my outputs. And that allows you to have highly testable, isolated code so that each piece has its purpose um, and you're not having this big web of, of problems, right? You, you isolate that code, you test it really well, it does one thing and you know it works. Um, and well tested. So one of the big benefits of dependency injection is the ability to easily test things. And I think we'll kind of go into that. I don't know how well like, I did this in this talk, but it's one of the biggest reasons why you want to use dependency injection. Um, another uh, technical requirement that we had, like we said, from the product side is really to avoid third party libraries unless it was absolutely needed. Um, and we wanted 100% call. So we wanted this because we had done about six, eight, nine months on our other app before it got decommissioned. Um, it got decommissioned because there were 15 million people using our main servicing app and there were two million people using our app. And they said, wow, you have this cool purchase notification. You can lock your card. These are things we want everybody to have. Why are the two apps? So anyway, <laughs> took all our features and, um, but we really liked Kotlin. It was a greenfield project. Here to greenfield and brownfield. Basically, greenfield is a brand new field that you can go out and do whatever you want with. So we had the opportunity to do 100% Kotlin. There are like three or four files that aren't, but just don't want to like convert base 64 encoders and things. And it works. Um, and we wanted dependency injection. So why 100% Kotlin? <laughs> Keynote skills. Um, Kotlin makes coding easy and concise. Um, and Kotlin makes, you like that? Kotlin makes dependency injection easy and concise. Um, so obviously that's my opinion again. But um, So what, why do we need dependency injection? Like I said, testing uh, mock flavors. This has been one of my like things I, probably a year into working at Capital One, I got big into mocks and testing because I've never been on a project where you just, you own that project and it like kind of you live with it. So I worked doing I mean, consulting projects and smaller things where you build something and then you move on to the next one and you go on. So things like testing and things that like more architecturally 
setting up architecture weren't things I specialized in. And so by, by getting to spend time on a project, you're like, oh, I want this to be better. I want to be able to do this. And dependency injection is something that, as you mature, you'll see, like, this is something that is really important in any software application that's going to live a long time. If you're hacking something, like, who cares? But, um, so custom debug features, environment switching. So we'll, we'll talk about a few examples. But with dependency injection, because you're passing in what you need, you can easily switch out what the code does, right? The code's single purpose. Here are my inputs. Now you can do something different to compute the output. Um, and this dependency injection promotes building more reusable code because this is one building block, this is another building block, and we kind of swap them in and out. Um, and dependency injection discourages the use of static singletons. I'm going to kind of bite my tongue on this later on because we use static singletons in our me method, but it's only one spot. Um, but I, I super dislike static singletons. Maybe somebody else has reasons why they, they don't mind it, but it's because you have one place in memory that everything accesses, and it's like this God object. Right, so I don't like that because you do testing or you have multi-threaded code, it's really hard to know like who's accessing things at what time and who's changing state. So um, dependency injection discourages that. And it enables all the really cool things I like to talk about. So like I said, one of the reasons I'm a Google developer expert is because I've gone out to a bunch of conferences and I do talks. And this was last year at DevFest Florida, or like, a year and a half ago or so. So this is a talk called A Screenshot is Worth a Thousand Words. It was about um, running UI tests for Espresso. And actually, I did this at the Java user group. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it, it was at BCU maybe in August or something like that. Uh, like two, three years ago or something like that. So I did speak here before. I forgot. Um, so I did, I did this talk, but I also did it in Florida. Um, also another, so anyway, testing is enabled through it. I, so dependency injection is super important. Building debug features, which for an Android app a lot of the time is you have this mobile device, right? Not everybody like that you give your app to has the ability to look at the logs, right? They can't just plug it in and be like, oh, I did a search ref on the logs, and of course this works. It's like somebody's going through and clicking on this, that, and they're like, well, did it fire my analytics? And how the heck are they gonna know that, right? They have to like go on some online dashboard or do something, but if you build something like a debug feature for analytics, every time one of your analytics are fired, you can push them off to the server. But you can also put an interceptor to capture them and then save them in some local in-memory storage or maybe a local database and then have another view that would actually show those on the device. So I could go through and my, my product owner could say, you know, I really want these analytics. How do I make sure they're there? Okay, click here, here, and here. Go look and see if they're all fired. So like that's one sort of thing there. And all these talks are available online as videos, so I can send anybody these if you want later. And then lastly, um, uh, HTTP mocking with Wiremock. So I, was, I helped the creator of this actually get it working, I guess in like 2015 on Android. So Wiremock, has anybody used this before? All right, it is, it is amazing. It's kind of like a Swiss army knife of HTTP mocking. I will say now that we just got it out of our code base and we're using mock web server, but it's because on Android it's a little bit too much probably. Um, it definitely serves a purpose, but we found that our use case really didn't need it and it's a big footprint, like we're saying. I don't want to pull in a jetty, I don't want to pull in a, Apache Commons and all these things that like thousands of uh, pieces of bytecode. So anyway, dependency injection is not magical. Sorry, I didn't update my slides from DevFest Florida, which was in Disney. So you get some more Disney magic here. Um, it's not magical. Dependency injection is only inversion of control. So what this means is you're passing in the things that you need instead of predefining them. So um, the example I saw recently about dependency injection was like with a timer or a clock, right? So based on the hour of the day, it would say, this is at night, this is in the morning, this is midday, afternoon, or evening. Right? So if you thought about your code base for the most part, if in there you said clock.getTime, like the system clock, then it would always be when you ran that test or that piece of code, it would always give you the current time. So how do you write a test to say, okay, it's morning right now, it should say morning, or it's the afternoon, it should say that. Um, if you just go ahead and have that dependency inside of there that's already predefined to be the system clock, it's not going to work. But if you put, pass in like a time, an hour provider, then that hour provider in your production code, you go ahead and like say, give me the current hour. And then your test, your hour provider just says it's 4 o'clock in the morning or it's 12 in the afternoon or whatever. So the inversion of control, if we like thought of that example in our head, right? So it's like a time, an hour time provider that you pass in and then you just say execute it, give me the hour. Um, instead of our code just 
create, having that dependency, which inside of it would just be like the system clock provider. Instead, my cool little blood emoji is like, <laughs> um, you're injecting um, your dependencies into your code. So your code is, hey, use time provider, give me the hour. Based on the hour, go ahead and display something. As long as you take your, t your time provider and you pass it into your code, then it doesn't matter, like, your code just says give me the time. It doesn't care what's happening. So dependency injection is basically a way of, of taking all these dependencies that are out there and helping you like organize them into the pieces of code that you need. So this example isn't the best, but it's what I had. And when you form in a bunch of slides, it's just easier to go with it. So I'll try to go with that. Um, so this right here is a Kotlin, just a Kotlin class. So if, if you looked at this in Java, it would be basically public static class network config and public static final uh, string is full URL and the public static final Boolean logo server, right? So if, if you just think of this network config class, everything is predefined, everything, nothing here is configurable. Um, this isn't the best example because these are like static, these are primitive types and I'm not passing in objects, but like I said, I didn't want to update the examples. <laughs> um, if you use something like setter injection, then you would basically create a class and this var means that um, it is a variable, like a string, and a boolean that has basically the ability to do git and set. So it's var, it can do git and set. Um, and so down here, you can create an instance of network config. And then inside of there, you could go ahead and say config.fullurl. And that's the same as dot set you full URL in Java. Um, and then is localhost server true? And so you can do dependency injection basically by creating one of these objects and then essentially changing the behavior here by setting these values and then having your code execute after that. Hey, um, yeah, so you can go ahead and do it that way. Uh, one thing that is kind of very similar to in the way we did it previously with Java is, um, so you have like your private, and then you have protected, your package private, and then public, right? So like package private is really nice in these scenarios for injection because what that means is if you're in the same package in Java, so like com.epon, see, I'm selling you guys, Epon USA, that, uh, you know, that whatever it is. As long as you're in that exact same package, you can access package private variables within there. So anywhere else in the code, I can't say like, you know, my instance of epon dot set coolness to true. I, but if I'm in that package, I can just literally say something like this in Java code, which is very easy and concise, and it's a nice way to do it. So we used to do this a lot with uh, our Java code when we ran tests. The thing that's really nice that the the way that I'm going to suggest here with the do-it-yourself method is with constructor um, So you can do constructor injection in Java. It's something that's been around forever. It's basically saying in my constructor, and this is a Kotlin constructor saying um, it requires you to send in a base URL and a port in the constructor, and then these are uh, two defined strings, like the type is inferenced, like kind of like you can see here. So it's a full URL as a string, localhost is a Boolean, but these variables are initialized, so it's the same as if in Java, in the constructor, you said, these are my two values, you had two fields, and then you computed everything in the constructor. So it's kind of hard to see here, but um, the main thing is you're passing in everything via constructor, and then everything happens out based on that. Um, the commonalities of both these methods, of setter injection and constructor injection, is really that inversion of control that we're talking about, where we're setting the dependencies before like the code is executing, which allows us to control how the behavior is going to work. So, aren't there libraries to do this for you? The answer is yes. How many people use Spring? I haven't. Sorry. Um, and so that's one of the things like I was talking about. Don't use. Hey, come on in. Um, there's drinks in the second fridge if you want to grab one too. Um, and and food. So yeah, um, there's libraries to do this. Like Spring is one. I used Juice for a long time. Um, Dagger came out. And we'll kind of go through what's available on Android. Because from our side, we had to pick one that worked well on Android. So open source dependency injection libraries that were, are there for Android are Dagger, Toothpick, Coin, and Coding. So Dagger and Toothpick have kind of been around for a while. Um, they're both written in Java purely. And Coin and Coding are written in Kotlin and kind of like the newcomers. Um, so I wanted to kind of show what our thought process was when evaluating these. Keynote skills. Um, all right, so code generation. So one thing with, so Gradle is the default build system for building Android projects. So it's not Ant, it's not Maven, it's Gradle. And um, do you all know what incremental compilation is? 
essentially, once compiled, code is compiled once, as long as that piece of code is not touched again, it doesn't need to be recompiled. So it saves time. <coughs> so Dagger, um, Dagger and Toothpick both heavily rely on annotations. So annotation basically is an extra little piece of metadata you can put on a piece of code. And then um, code generation, as, as the build happens, basically looks at the annotation, looks at the code, and then is able to generate more code from that. So this is like super powerful, and it got really popular for a while because it does enable like you to write such like such concise like code because you're writing these annotations, and then the, the generation process is making it all for you. So all that boilerplate you had to do in Java, many libraries just using annotations. Um, but the problem in Android was if you have code generation, it breaks in from a compilation. At least up till now, there's now a way where you can kind of there's some of the libraries are getting away with it. Um, but it breaks that, and we knew that we wanted the fastest builds as possible. Like we wanted to stay away from that, so we said X. We're not going to use one that uses code generation. And if you talk to anybody a dependency injection on Android, Dagger is a thing that comes up. It's really powerful, but nobody knows how it works. I, like I'm one of the experts or whatever. Probably know like three people that actually really know how to use it. And so it's I don't know. Any anybody else on the teams I worked with, they they don't really know what's going on. And so it's just one of those things that's kind of unapproachable. And that's something I don't like about dependency injection. Um, it is one of those like Disney magic things. I don't really know what's going on. Um, but um, the next thing was single instance. So I talked about how I don't like single instances. Um, and then coin is one. The problem with this when building an SDK is if the client application that you're going inside of uses coin as well, you're both interacting with the same coin dependency injection like setup. And so that's just a no-no. Like, we can't have access to their things, they can't have access to ours because that might mess things up. Um, Coden is another library, and that does not use single instance. So, so when you say single instance, so you're not talking about static. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so basically it's... But not single instance. Like Spring, by default, if you create a bean, it's yeah. a single instance, by default. You can t say you don't want it to work that way. Hmm. But that's it's a single, it's one instance, it's not a static instance. So what do you... So in this case, it would be, so they, you'd always say like coin, which is like, you, it would be static functions that operate on this. So it would be coin dot do this, coin dot whatever. So it's like their code, their registry, it's a single point of registry. So I'm sorry, like, yeah, I guess I don't know exactly the way to define a singleton versus a static instance. But singleton means there's one. Yeah, single, so that's runtime. Oh, okay. Static is like you can't, there's no swapping. Got it, got it. So that's, okay, right. So dependency injection is great because you create a, you create your graph of dependencies and the single thing is there. So it's one single instance, a new instance. That's right. Where if you have your static, it's like this one thing that get instance, there's no other way to do it. Correct. Yeah, see? Static. You learn things at this meeting. This is good. Um, all right. So coin was out because we just, it's something that we couldn't do in a client app. It, might be great for your app itself, um, but not when you're SDK. And coin, Coden wasn't even available at the time. So we kind of, based on all these things, we kind of said, well, can we do it ourselves? Oh, well actually, another last thing is, does it add a dependency on another library? And all of these do in some respect. It comes along with extra code. So that was one of the principles we wanted to do early on, is like, be like, wait, don't bring along extra libraries. Um, so we kind of said, let's do it ourselves, based on this kind of very high level evaluation that I tried to come up with. So how much work is the do-it-yourself method? Let's see what I said. Not that much. <laughs> there you go, done. Um, it's slightly more verbose. Um, and I said this, I was watching back the, the version of this talk I did in Florida because I haven't practiced it since then except for once. Um, but I was like, gross and verbose. Um, so that's kind of like how Java felt. But you don't, you know, it's not super verbose in Kotlin. Um, but one of the things with manual dependency injection is it's harder to build advanced features. So do you guys do scoping at all with um, dependency injection? Okay. Not people that not many people that I know do. It's usually just like one dependency graph with singletons, and that's pretty much how it works. Um, I'll go into how you can do things um, like advanced features like scoping, but essentially you would use factories, right? So you create a factory that creates a certain object or certain types, and then whenever you need that, you create it, use the factory, create it, and then after that, you'd operate on it, and then you'd garbage collect it after that. Um, 
So this would be great for simple cases when you don't already um, know a dependency library very well. So I, I said this because I didn't want people to say like, well, Jagger's amazing, I love it, right? Like why would, why would I use this dumb way? Um, so those people can go use their library, that's what I'm saying. But like this method of DIY is really great for simple projects and even for more complex ones we have like ours. So um, here it out. Um, this is my like kind of sample app that I have out there. I kinda, any presentation I do, I go and update this. If you've been to Fresh Market in Carytown, I went in and took pictures of almost everything in that store. So that's what you'll see in the application. Um, that was kind of uh, an investment, but it's paid off. So um, yeah, it's basically just a simple app that does log in. You kind of get in there, you add things to a shopping cart. Um, I got some new features that I just wrote for the DroidCon Boston thing where I do like data persistence. It has like cool animations with a shopping cart and adds things and saves it to the disk. Um, but I actually did a PR for this that I actually showed in GitHub. But if you look through my PRs for this, you'll see a DIY, DIY um, dependency injection conversion. Because I did use Dagger um, when I built this originally. I said, well, Dagger is the way to do it. You know, it's kind of hard. Maybe a sample app will be easier to kind of do it in. I did it. And then I was like, there's all this configuration and all these things, and what I'm doing is really not that complex. So I was able to use a method we figured out at work and then go ahead and implement it on this. So you can check it out. Um, so in mathematics, computer science, and digital electronics, a dependency graph is a directed graph representing dependencies of several objects toward each other. What? Um, <laughs> essentially, kind of what you're saying is like, you have all of your dependencies, and they kind of start from one space, right? And based on that, like, one gets put into another, gets put into another, so you're, you're kind of like building out all the things you need with, with the core components, right? So you might have multiple things at this first level, but it's the way that you can access all these things and they kind of interact with each other, but we call them a graph, and that's why I kind of put this on here, so each time you create a collection of dependencies, it's called a graph in our case. Um, so I've inserted a few slides just for this talk, but why would this be less desirable in Java? So much boilerplate, it really is. Like, and, and like what I'm saying, I don't know about 9, 10, 11, and 12, but neither does anybody else have to teach you. Um, and, and Kotlin, in my opinion, is so much better, at least, I kept caveating this because I didn't want to piss anybody off, but at least better than Java 7 and 8. So um, this is from a blog post I wrote early this year that's called Building Objects with Kotlin. So pardon the animated GIF, but it, this is like my promo GIF here. So basically, I'm creating a data class, network request, that has some strings, a map, body, um, and then I'm instantiating a network request. URL, method, Android Studio give you hints. So you're not actually saying the name of the method, um, but unless it's a specific type, it, it doesn't infer it necessarily. Then there's things called name parameters that um, Android Studio can use autocomplete for, so you can actually swap around all the ordering of all your uh, values kind of going fast here, but basically you can take this out now and these things that I want to be default values, I can actually go ahead and take them and put them at the top here. So by default method, it's going to be get unless I send something else in. Um, and then I can do initialization block like I would do in a constructor and then do some validations while it was fast, but <laughs> hopefully I didn't have to write all those slides. So um, What I'm showing here though is that it's really like, it's a, a lot, not very much code when you use all these features such as Data classes, which essentially are just like a group of, of variables. Um, the ability to use name parameters. So when you have a bunch of stuff on a constructor, I don't care if I have 10 things on a constructor anymore because it doesn't matter the order. I just say the name of it and it's auto-completed and I say what I want. So it used to be in Java, you just have like 12 things going across and you're like, what's what? Especially when it's like true, 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 true. And you're like, did I just like, did I turn on something I'm not supposed to? So like when you have name parameters, it's just a really nice way to, to read it. Oh, and lastly, it had like the default parameters up there, which is really nice because if you're like 90% of the time it's going to do this or be this value, set it as a default, then you don't have to specify it. So what does Kotlin have to make this doable? Um, so lambdas are really nice. They're anonymous functions you can pass around. So like if you think about that time provider, it's going to give you what hour of the day it is. You're essentially just saying execute this one block of code and return back this like integer value. So a lambda could be used to do that. Um, that's really nice, it's really, you don't have to write a full class, you literally just say, here's my input, here's my output, here's my lambda function. Um, one thing that's nice, does everybody know about by lazy in Kotlin? So if you say like this variable by lazy, um, what it will do is, until you access the variable, so you say like the class dot that property, it won't actually instantiate it. So let's just say that you have something super expensive. Um, 
that's like, I'm gonna go out and make 10 network requests, right? It's this one object, when you create it, it goes and makes 10 network requests. But you don't really need it until you get further on in your application. If you make it by lazy, then when you first start up the app, it'll just create this like, it'll create it there, but until you say, go and instantiate it, it won't actually run any of the code. So it just gives you a way not to like, have the code there, but not um, run until it's accessed. So, um, all right, and this is doing good. Um, let's see here. So DI enables swapping and dependencies on a graph. Like I said, it's kind of a collection. Um, I talked about how this helps with mock servers because if you input that I want it to be a mock server versus a testing server versus a live server, you can put that dependency in. Um, and the graph is where you configure all these dependencies. You just swap out the pieces that you need and then your application will change its behavior. Or you can provide a brand new graph. So say that because sometimes you want to take a graph, like let's say 10 items, and you really only want to change one. So you'd like extend it and then just change the one. But other times you just want to like give a whole set of all test values or something. Um, so this is an example of what a network graph could look like in the DIY method. Um, so in this case, like if you have a network graph that is responsible for going out and fetching data about, and this is the shopping app example, like what categories of items there are, what the items are, and what the currently logged in user are, um, then you want to go ahead and represent these as a graph. And th th these things can be implemented in any way. Um, so, kind of digging in, what does this look like underneath the hood? So this is a network graph implementation that uh, implements network graph. So because of that, I have to go ahead and make sure I provide these things. So when I do, I have to use like override val. So that's what we have here. Override val, override val, override val. So as long as I have these, it's happy and it knows like what it should use. But everything else here under the hood is kind of like how dependency injection is working. There's actually like, I'm having to use retrofit, fit, which is like um, a way to like kind of um, interact with uh, APIs. Like it's nice like code, not code generation, but anyway, it's a nice way to like interact with APIs. It makes it a lot simpler. And then uh, different shopping services with retrofit. So anyway, it's, it's a nice way to like abstract those things away. Because these are details that you don't want to deal with when you actually run your code. You just want to say, give me these categories or items or whatever. Um, if you actually zoomed out, let's see. Oh yeah, there's just so much more behind the scenes. Um, so there'd be a lot more to this. Like there's actually building the Moshi converter and the RX2 Java call adapter and it kind of just gets really long. Um, if you have used Dagger, a component is very similar to the way these graphs work. In this case, the network graph really just exposes these repos. Those are the three things that any, anything in your app would actually access and care about. Underneath it, like you could just have mocks so the repo could just return some value. But a, the way the repo is really powered is it has these things behind the scene. So, uh, okay, HTTP, which is gonna be your networking requests, same with retrofit, like configuration services, and that is hidden to your code. That just is how this implementation is set up. This, this is probably where you guys are gonna get a little bit lost or whatever, so just ask questions, slash, let's just let it slide and we'll hang out, whatever. Um, so session graph would be another way that we could do a mini graph. Because we have so many modules, each one kind of has its own little graph for its dependencies. So in this case, you care about a session manager, a checkout cart, and user preferences. Each one of these is really kind of like its own interface, like we're saying, it's like a provider, or, or it's doing what it needs to do. Underneath there, we go ahead, and in this case, we would you know, use the implementations that we need. Um, so, like I said, each module can actually have its own graph. So nested graphs are okay. So like if your application in general or like your SDK has a networking graph and a session graph and whatever else, that's okay. It's like a collection, but you can access it all from your app graph and kind of go out and get things as needed, but it helps separate things out. Let's see, yeah, so I talked about each module needs their own graph and it's similar to Dagger components. Um, yeah, so by lazy, I talked about a little bit, but it's a language feature of Kotlin that delays initialization and then caches that result. So as soon as you access it once, every time you access it after that, it'll be the same value that got created, or the same instance. Um, so what's nice here is if you did your uh, network graph by lazy, then what you're doing is, um, when you say dot network graph, it'll go ahead and run your constructor. Um, however, every time you access it afterwards, it'll be that cached value instance that was already there. Uh, factories, so people have asked like, how do you, in, in Android, like you have activities, which is basically a single screen. And if you have one of those, you may have things that you just care about for that activity and then you want to throw away. So every time you load the activity, you want to have a factory that kind of generates everything you need, the instance you need, and then throw it away. 
So factories um, you can do with lambdas in the way that basically when you access this item on the graph, it's going to generate these dependencies for you or instances of that. So in this case, a database factory would generate this database. Scoping, um, this is kind of like what I was talking about where each activity might have their own or each screen might have their own. This is something that's more complex because really what we've talked about is that singleton thing where there's one, you create one instance of everything, it kind of generates out. Um, and so scoping is harder because what that means is it's not just like one big static graph, it kind of gets out to the graph, then you get to a factory, and at this point, then that is available for a certain amount of time. So this is the hard part. We're still kind of working on it a little bit, but you honestly kind of don't need it most of the time until you want to get more performant um, and things like that. Setting up your graphs. Um, does anybody know the Android application lifecycle? So this is basically when the Android app starts. You want to initialize it then. If you do it at that point in time, then um, you'll have it. Uh, when you go forward, otherwise you'll get no, no pointer exceptions when you try to access anything. And this is some other ways that you can access that. You guys aren't super in, don't know Android too well, so I'm gonna kind of skip. Um, so supporting graphs and modules. So, sorry, I haven't looked at these slides since Florida, so <laughs> I got like all the way up to then, so I'm kind of winging it right now. Um, let's see, so an app graph takes in a, con okay, so this is your application graph. The one thing you need for this is a context an Android that's basically access to all the system resources, whether it's preferences, whether it's your Bluetooth, whether it's anything else like that. So when you have that, you can go ahead and create your, this is your <coughs> public static like bar or whatever. It's something that anybody can access. It's that single instance. Is that the way we say it? Um, so that's the bad thing. So at the end of the day, you create all your instances, but then you assign it in this one spot. And this is a hack for Android, and we call it actually a sad hack in our code, just because we need a way to access it from activities. Activities are generated outside of our control. So if you're using constructor injection, you're able to just pass everything in, but activities are actually created by Android, and then you just kind of say, here's this activity that's created. So we have to go back and get the graph somewhere else. So this is kind of, since you guys aren't super familiar with Android, um, activities and fragments, like I said, are generated by the system. So we don't have control over the constructors, therefore we can't pass in everything. So we have to access the instance of our graph and then pull everything from there. Now we can still, as we start the application or start our test, we populate that graph with everything we need. So it's gonna have what we need when we get there. I'm gonna kind of skip over these things because this is all super Android specific and you don't know Android, it's kind of just hurt your head. It's hurting mine. Um, so basically, if you have questions about Android, about how this would work in activities and fragments, talk to me. It's, it's really the Android life cycle, like I'm saying. It generates these things for you. So these are kind of like the sad hacks that you have to do to get around it. If you're doing Kotlin and anything and else, like everything I've set up to this point is absolutely true. So I wanted to make sure that you guys got those parts. But these are, if you're doing Android, reach out to me and I can get more into these things. So pro tips. All right, we're getting towards the end here. Pro tips are... Um, try to avoid late and late init var for injected values. So this is just, I wanted to call it like a pet peeve I have with Kotlin. So first of all, I love immutable data. So that means I like vowels in Kotlin. A vowel it says is essentially like this is final. So you set it once, and it's done. Um, if you have a var, that means you can get it, you can set it, it's mutable. And if you do a late init val, it is something that you're saying, it's a, it's a variable that I'm gonna set at some point, I promise. Like, I'm gonna initialize, late in is literally like, I'm gonna initialize it later. Um, and so it just, it can cause no pointer exceptions and things in your code. It's something that you have to do in some cases, but like, I really don't like it. So avoid late in it if you can. It's like something that like, I think the creators of Kotlin were like, why did we do that? Oops. Um, but it kind of got around a few use cases they need. And I, essentially, like I said, it can cause exceptions if you use it. And a var, like I said too, creates mutable state, which we don't like. Um, so in Android, as I'm saying, like, you want to put as little code as you need on the device. When you write Kotlin, the Kotlin compiler takes that and creates Java bytecode. So if you have one Kotlin file, you could actually end up creating like eight Kotlin or eight Java classes out of that. So the compiler does that for you. When you use by lazy, so you're saying like this time provider by lazy is this. In order to delay that initialization and catch the value of what got created, it's having to create an anonymous holder class. That essentially is the class there ready to get fired whenever you access it, it gets fired and that saves that one value. So on Android, anytime you use ByLazy, you're creating this anonymous class. When we first started, it was like, ByLazy is so cool, but then you look at the bytecode and you're like, 
I have so much bike code there and like I'm shipping an extra 50k, 100k to my clients and that's not something they want. So it's great in the server side or somewhere else but when you get on mobile it's something you may want to avoid. And you can use Git. So essentially what this is, is you, it's a, defining a Gitter but in a very like concise way. Um, let's see. So accessing dependencies from the graphs. Right, so this is like, if you have a login presenter, does anybody use like MVP or like model view presenter when some of their like UI based applications? Essentially what it means is the model is the data that's coming in. The view is the actual like, here's a box here, text box or whatever else. And the presenter is the actual logic behind it. So you need, when the presenter is like the brains that says, I'm gonna take this data and put it over here in this view. So the view you need, because that's where you're actually gonna set these values, like this input field or this checkbox or whatever, but then you need the data sources for the model. So you need the session manager and the user repo and those things, the, the presenter now can be used to do all those things. So if you were going to build your presenter, the way you do it is um, you give it the login view because you're in your screen and you have that view right there. But then from your graph, because you want this centralized place of like um, controlling your, your dependencies, you go ahead and just from the graph, from the session graph, get it. And that way, when you created your application or when you started up the, the app, you had everything that you predefined. Um, this is that weird little like get syntax. What's kind of cool is so like this is a private file. So the way that you operate on it is a session manager would be like whatever class this is in, um, you just say dot session manager. And what would happen is instead of just returning its value, it would actually create like a getter essentially behind it. So this could actually, this is like a lambda. You can have like one property, but you can actually execute a piece of code. It's just a really nice, concise way of doing gets. And what's nice about this in Android, because like you don't have, you can't do the constructor injection. If you do these, it's a way that once everything kind of initialized, um, it can go ahead and actually access these things. And because they're getters, it's not doing it upon initialization. It's waiting until later. And so you're not gonna hit some of those null pointer things. It's actually been initialized at that point. Key takeaways. You don't have to use dependency injection, bye bye dagger. If you want, if you like dagger, keep it. Maybe teach me how to do it. You make a lot of money if you know dagger. So teach me. Yeah, um, yeah there are no magic annotations. So have you anybody seen like Java X inject? So that's essentially like the JSR specification for dependency injection. I think the people that actually wrote Juice ended up creating it because they were the first people. Juice was one of the first frameworks that used annotations on Java code to do dependency injection. Before that, in Spring and other things, you always use like XML configuration to say like when you access this sort of thing, it'll create one instance of this. And it was more of a service locator, but it provided that same sort of like swappability. Um, but yeah, you don't have to rely on that anymore because everything's built in. Um, the Kotlin language features, and I know it was like a breeze course here, but there's a lot of cool things in Kotlin that makes this a lot more concise and doable. It's not gross and verbose. Um, and dependency injection is really critical for any app. Like I said, once you hit a certain scale for any application that's not a proof of concept, you want dependency injection so that um, you have that configurability and you have testing. Thank you, Capital One, or something like that. Um, <laughs> I had another thing, like Capital One is hiring, but now they're like, we have a budget freeze. So anyway, talk to me if you're a good developer and we'll hang out. Um, yeah, anyway, so that's that. Thank you very much. So if, if, if Android is basically moving from Java to Kotlin, is Android then using a Kotlin bike code evaluator? No, it's all Java. Well, yeah. because so then, but if it's just translated to Java, well, so, to bike, so, so there bike. is Kotlin native. So if you write everything like using pure Kotlin, and you're not using like that jar file of another library, the pure Kotlin. You can compile, compile Kotlin to JavaScript or to native C or like all sorts of things. So compiling to the Java virtual machine is one part. And that's what we use on it. Dumb question. There's not two dumb questions. We you gotta argue over who's a dumber. Okay. Um, <laughs> Nobody's a dumb. Question. Probably used all the time, but what is reactive programming in this Sure, absolutely. So there's let's see the easiest way is. So do you know what a listener is? Yes. So a listener, this is, let's see the best example. Okay, 
So in this case, um, in, in our, our authentication thing, we, we actually maintain the session of like, who's the currently logged in user? And there's a lot of pieces of your code that are interested to say like, who, who is logged in and let me know when something changes. So one way you could do it is to poll. So let's say there's like a session manager. Every once in a while you can just be like, hey, who's logged in? Hey, who's logged in? And so that's just like your standard way of doing it. If you gave it a listener, then it could hold that listener and then essentially every single time if it kept that listener, basically go ahead and fire and be like, hey, this is what happened. So then you would know somebody logged in, somebody logged out. And so fundamentally, that's kind of like how Reactive works. It's, it's, it's a nice, concise way, and there's so many more functions and things with it, but it, it's a way of like things like kind of coming to you and, and like this thing causes a reaction to cause something else versus like a pulling mechanism. It's like asynchronous. Yes. Like from the jump. You okay. know, like so the whole thing is based on it, everything being asynchronous. Yeah, and then like when you do it, essentially every single time you execute one of these, you say the thread pool that you want it to run on, run this on IO, run this on background, run it on my UI thread, but it kind of like handles, reactive frameworks handle these things behind the scenes. It's like so. nothing's blocking. Even yeah. It's all, everything's supposed to be asynchronous. There should be no like, call this yeah. wait. You get a result, right? Cool. Yeah. So like if you did something with listeners or lambdas, that's kind of what that's doing. But like when you use reactive frameworks, all the background threading yeah. stuff is away from you. So. so even like the traditional saving to a database, like the Postgres, that's not necessarily going to be reactive. Yeah. So something like a, maybe a Mongo, where Fire forget kind of thing. Like some cool things you could do is like so if you think about a network request where you're like two things that have two network requests that have, have to happen simultaneously and the results of those, then you generate one response from that. Right. Typically you go down in the synchronous program, you'd say, give me request number one, stop. It went until it's done, request number two, and be done. Where there's some operators where essentially with background tasks, you say go do both of these and you're listening reactively for when those are done. So it doesn't necessarily matter which one is done first, but then when both are done, it would complete the circuit essentially, and you could then you know, finish your code. So it's a lot of really interesting ways of looking at things when you work reactively. Yeah. So does Kotlin have any like asynchronous things that Java itself doesn't have? Yeah, so, um, so it's not, the, in the types in Kotlin, like the default thing, but there's a supported Kotlin library by JetBrains called um, Kotlin Coroutine. And so that is essentially the reactive framework. Um, right now, it only has channels, and that's what we ended up using, which is more like this hot stream of things. This is where like reactive programming is really hard, but then there's cold flows, which is more like RX Java, where it's basically like defining something that's gonna be reactive, but not actually like listening for anything until you execute it. Um, and that's actually coming out soon as one of the features is like an alpha now. But the answer to that question is you're not using Rx Java or some framework, it's using Kotlin Coroutine. You could use Rx Java if you want to still, but Kotlin Coroutine is the thing for Kotlin that you use for reactive programming. Spring, Spring has a reactive library you can use. So if you use Spring, you can make theoretically something that's completely reactive application. Any other questions? Cool, high five all right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming. Cool. Can I get a quick selfie real quick? Can you sit down or sit down? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um.